if you can think uh, for a moment, for a time, of um, conversations that you've had at the table, and there's a, there's a wide range of what that looks like in our household. Uh, we still have all of our kids at home, and, and we, we treasure the time of just sitting around the table and, and catching up for the day. I don't know that our kids always enjoy that, but mom and dad always enjoy that, that catching up. And, and we, you come through the holidays sometimes, and, and remember back when you had everybody together, the extended family was together, and you really treasure those conversations. And, and there, there may be some people listening to this talk that, man, those are rare times when you have even one other member of the family there, and so we're sensitive to that too. But if you can recall the dynamics of what happens having a seat at the table and enjoying each other's conversation. And sometimes it's the banter back and forth of uh, teasing one another and, and uh, relegating and catching up a little bit. And maybe, it's, maybe you remember the days of uh, sitting at the kiddie table and finally you're able to sit at the big table. I still remember the moment in time when I discovered I could see the top of the table growing up. That was such a big deal. And finally, when I grew up t tall enough, taller than my mom, to be able to see the top of the refrigerator, that was a big deal. And just something about the maturation as sitting at the table. And sometimes as a kid, even just sitting there and listening and gleaning the conversation that's going on. And finally, you have something to add to the conversation. And yet you've been included this whole time as being part of that conversation at the table. And sometimes the conversation gets deep and sometimes it's shallow, sometimes it's that place where someone shared, hey, guess what, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, we're expecting. Or maybe, guess what, mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa, I've got cancer. So sometimes that, that varies, those conversations, but there's, there's a place for that at the proverbial table where we meet and, and take a chair and, and just hear what's going on among those that we include. And, and I want us to look at some bookends today, kind of an odd passage. We're going to go to Colossians, and we're just going to use the bookends of Colossians. And we're going to peer in on the conversations that may have happened, or at least see who was there included in those conversations. At the beginning of Colossians, it says Paul. And so, sometimes uh, you play musical chairs when you get together. Who sits where, right? Who sits where at the table? And, and oftentimes it's the patriarch or the matriarch or whoever's hosting has that seat of prominence, has that privilege. And, and this is Paul. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And next to him is, is young Timothy. Timothy, our brother, Colossians opens up. To the holy and faithful brothers of Christ, to Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. They're writing... He's kind of under house arrest, and he's writing to uh, the people of Colossae, which is a whole other table somewhere else, for them to have a conversation around. And so Paul and Timothy writing to Colossae and wishing them the best. And Who is Paul, by the way? Some of us old school kind of recognize who Paul was, that, that Paul was once Saul, and, he, and it, was, it was Saul that was steeped in the, in the law, and he was a Jew, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, we find out. And, and in his pursuit of the law and becoming a Pharisee, he even uh, became zealous to persecute the church. And somewhere along the way, um, on one of his routes to go take after the church and persecute them, he had a Jesus moment on the road to Damascus. And it changed his life, flipped it upside down to the point where now he was one of the main missionaries going forth and sharing this, this Jesus, this gospel, good news, truth. That, that was Paul. Over half of the New Testament is in the perspective of Paul. So I want you to see he's sitting at the table in perspective here. Over half of the New Testament. That's a lot of perspective to be shared between the letters and, and the story of Acts and how it talks about Paul and his perspective and how... How the mystery of Christ consumed him. And to his right would be seated Timothy, young Timothy, who's, who's been discipled by Paul along the way. Now, now Paul is, is a Jew, though he has a Roman citizen, but, but Timothy, if I can say this, he's a half-breed. His dad was of, of, of a Greek background, and his mom and his grandma was of Jewish background. So he has odd roots, kind of a go-between in, in some of those cultures. This is Timothy. And if you were to subtract two or three books of what Paul wrote 
and, and look through Tim. Timothy is in two-fifths of the New Testament. He's almost always there by Paul's side. These are significant people having a seat at the table. And they're kind of co-writing this book to, to the Colossi people, writing this letter to them, encouraging them, recalling to them their new identity in Christ. And so if these are the people at the table, what's on the table? What's on the table? What are they talking about? This is, this is the other bookend. So that's the front bookend of who they're writing to and who they are. And they're writing to the people of Colossae. And he sums it up this way in chapter 4. He says, be devoted. Th- those of you that are listening to this letter, read- reading this letter, be devoted to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And oftentimes when we think of the word prayer, we, we, it's so flippant nowadays. It's like this is, okay, I acknowledge God on who he is. Maybe I get that far. But oftentimes it's our petitions. Man, this is what I'm bringing before you, God. And rarely do we take the time in prayer, myself included, where prayer is a conversation. It's a conversation. And, and in a conversation, it's not just one way. It's It's listening also. It's spending the time in prayer to listen. And that's why he says be watchful and thankful. Those are words of listening, listening. Be devoted to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And Paul says pray for us also that God might open up a door of opportunity to share the message. And that's what's what's to be consumed on this proverbial table is the message, the mystery of Christ. And it's so easy just to read over that because we're churchgoers to some degree. But if you were to put, your, put yourself in Paul's position, who lived in the day and age when the mystery was revealed, man, that is a big deal. Especially Paul, because he was steeped in Judaism and, and rarely took thought to think about that Messiah could come to pass in his day. And that mystery, that great mystery is that, oh my goodness, God, the, the creator of all things, decided in his plan and in his program that, that he was going to send his, his son, the God-man, Jesus, down here to identify with us. He took on human form, made in human likeness, and so he was able to sympathize in all ways, the things that we go through, the highs, the lows. That was, that's the mystery is that God, Emmanuel, God with us, not only in the nativity, but growing up and maturing and And then ultimately, living that perfect life to take the sacrifice, the once-for-all sacrifice. Paul's getting this. He's like, oh my goodness, we don't have to do those sacrifices anymore because Jesus did it once for all. This mystery is now being revealed. And not only, not only is this mystery is that God became man to take our place, to identify with us, but it's like, he says in Colossians that we are hidden now in him. Therefore, our identity is as of Christ. So there's this switch of identities that's happening here. So, so therefore, God, when he looks at us, if we have trusted and placed our trust in Christ, the mystery is, oh my goodness, he doesn't see Phil anymore. He sees Jesus when he looks at me. And that is something to be consumed at the table, is that when God no longer looks on us with condemnation, but the mystery is, oh my goodness, he looks on me as if he's seeing his very own son. And that's, that's what Paul and that's what Timothy is all about when they're writing this letter to the Colossi people. I want you to get this, this identity exchange that just happened here in Christ. And so he's including his associates, his cohorts. This is the conversations that went across the table and he introduces us to these people. Verse 7 of chapter 4. And I don't want you to miss these first two individuals because they are included in the conversation, but they're sent out. They are the messengers that are carrying this letter of Colossae from most likely Rome, where Paul is incarcerated under house arrest, where he's given certain freedoms. And they take this letter to really a tri-city area, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossae. And they were to rotate these letters around. And he sends these two individuals. And I want you to think about that. In that day and age, it wasn't like they were going to take a plane. I doubt they had Pony Express. They had to get there somehow, and this, this Christianity was something that was trying to be dampened by the kingdom, and so they had to kind of stealthily go across land and maybe even by sea to get to Colossae, which is on the kind of the far end of the Lycan Valley. He'd pass through Laodicea and Hierapolis first and then finally get there, and who are these people? Verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. 
I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He's been entrusted with this letter, this precious letter that's, that's going to the Colossi people. And maybe a couple more letters as we'll read about. And this is Tychicus. You, you don't just entrust a letter like that to anybody. So there's high favor on Tychicus. And, and I don't want you to miss who he's with. There's a pair of them carrying this letter. And this, this, this guy that's with him, his name is Onesimus. Now, most of you, your grandkids won't be named after Onesimus. There's a play on words with him, actually. And we find out more about him in the book of Philemon. Philemon. And if you need to check off a book for the year, it's a one-pager, there's a good place to start. Philemon. And Philemon is, is all about this reconciliation between this guy right here and his master. See, he was a slave. Even more than that, he was a bondservant. And so what that means is somewhere along the way, in order for him to, to get a loan, either to um, have a business or to make a house or to get his family together, he had to put up some collateral for that loan. And so he went to Philemon for this loan. And his collateral was himself. He was a bond servant. And so he would serve for so long uh, with, a, with a Philemon as his master. But he cut him short. And Onesimus ran away from his credit. And he didn't, didn't want to pay that. And he runs away. And guess who he runs into? Hello, Paul. Right? <laughs> Game over. Because Paul begins to disciple him and mentor him to the point where he's a trusted servant, to where he can not only take the letter, we believe, of Colossae, but he's bringing the letter to, of Philemon with him as well and some other letters. Think about the credit, the credibility of what's going on here because here is this not only letter of encouragement and these men that we're going to find out about around the table and the conversations that's taken place, but here's just by showing up just by coming back and saying, I'm sorry, forgive me, here I am. I'm a different person now, but I'm willing to surrender that to you. There's, there's a gravity, there's a weight to the two of these guys having a seat at the table and carrying that message on. Maybe to Paul's left is, is this guy. We don't know much about him. I don't want to forget any of the other stuff. Um, the conversation that they were having here about the mystery was, was of such gravity uh, earlier on, on in chapter 4. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, that so you may know how to answer everyone. Guess what? The guys around this table, they checked off on this. If you're going to attach my name to what's going on, they checked off on this. So, so their conversation and their actions had to match up. So that their actions was such that when they had a conversation about the mystery of Christ, someone couldn't say something about them to say, no, I don't believe you. But there was great credibility that was being built here. And then he goes on and talks about Tychicus and Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. They will tell you everything is happening here. And then he goes on to tell about this guy that was maybe to his left, this Aristarchus, again, not another name that you'd maybe name your grandchild or your baby after, Aristarchus. And I'm probably butchering the name, but that's the American English version of his name. There we go. Aristarchus, who is this guy? Well, it says, my fellow prisoner. Evidently, he was in bonds with Paul. And fellow has a deep Seated root of koinonia, a fellowship, someone who's, who's ran the gauntlet with Paul. And we're given a couple clues. He actually shows up in the story a couple other times. And I want to share some of those because I picture Aristarchus as kind of a gentle giant. You ever meet somebody like that? Some guy that's, that's just like big and could like take you down just like that, but yet comes off as a teddy bear? That's kind of how I picture Aristarchus and, and some of the nuances as we see him in Scripture. He's willing to to be of bond with Paul in this situation. One of the first times, he's from Macedonia, he's a Thessalonica, we're, we're told. He shows up on some of Paul's missionary trips and comes alongside him. But one of the more prominent places we see him, Paul is teaching in this city of Ephesus. If you can maybe see that in the old 
Roman Greco world. And, and Ephesus was one of the great wonders of the world. And had a big giant amphitheater there. And, and Paul spent more time in Ephesus than he did in any other city. He spoke there for two or three years. And almost had like a collegiate tile, style setting that he was teaching and discipling the people. So much so that, that the craftsmen living in that city were losing business because the people who once worshipped the idols that they were creating quit buying and worshipping those idols. So it was starting to put them out of business. So these, so these people, these craftsmen stirred up the people to go riot Paul. And so they, they kind of stormed the, the theater there to go after Paul. And Aristarchus steps in front of them. And a guy by the name of Gaius. So that Paul can get away. He stands in the gap. It's as if he took a bullet for Paul so Paul could get away. That, that's, that's tremendous character of this Aristarchus who is here. And he continues and he shows up in the storyline a few more times. One of the times we see him is when, when Paul, after all of his missionary trips, and he'd been back to Jerusalem, and, and uh, he was, uh, because of his citizenship, he said, take me to Caesar in that court. I don't want to sit underneath just the Jewish court because they would just have my head. And so, so they were going to take him away. In order to get there, they had to take a ship to get there. And guess who gets on the ship with him? Aristarchus is there. Now, some of you know what happened on the ship. It wrecked. The ship wrecked, and, and Paul was sure through, through God that God was going to save and rescue all of their lives. Guess what? Guess who can lend credibility to that story? Aristarchus was there. He was there on that ship in bonds with Paul. So this, friends, if you've ever had someone sitting at the table that was a close confidant, this would be it. This would be it. This would be the bouncer that you would want with you. This would be the bodyguard that you would want with you. This would be a trusted individual. The person next to him, not so much. Really surprised to see him here. And some of you know the story. Sitting in this seat, after the greetings of Aristarchus, so does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And then it has to add a little bit because they may have history and know who Mark is. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. This is Mark. This is John Mark. This is Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark, we believe. He shows up about ten times throughout the Scripture in some odd passages. Who is this Mark? It's, it's the same Mark that his mother hosted the disciples sometimes in Jerusalem. That's where he lived. And on their first missionary trip, when, when Paul was sent out with Barnabas, they decided to take a third wheel. Mark. Kind of wet behind the ears to some degree. And he went on the trip. And somewhere along the cycle of that trip, Mark wanted to go home. He was ready to go back to Jerusalem. And it caused such stiff conflict between Paul and Mark that Barnabas kind of got in the middle of it. And it's hard to admit this, but sometimes even in our good friendships, there's friendly fire. And oftentimes Mark gets a bum rap on this, but we don't know. We don't know if it was, you ever been in that story where there's, there's two sides of the story, but there's just conflict. They can't get along. And Barnabas and, Barnabas and, and Mark start their own missionary voyance. And, and, and Paul ends up picking up silence, Silas, and they go on their missionary trip. But there was conflict, great conflict. And to even see that in, in the book of Acts, it kind of stirs us and we wonder, man, what happened between these two guys? But the significance of our story today is Mark is sitting at the table. He's being included in the mystery going forward to Colossae. And for, we don't know all the backstory other than Paul said, hey, welcome him when he comes. Because they may know of some of that difficulty that they had and, and breaking of their fellowship. He now has a seat at the table. There, there's favor here. There's reconciliation in that, re, in that relationship, Mark. And there, there's someone sitting in this chair if I were just to say his name without his Greek name, it'd be a little confusing. Jesus is sitting in this chair. You're like, what? Yeah, look at it. It says, uh, Jesus, who is called Justice. Okay, Whew. I thought I knew the story, right? So this is another guy by the name of Jesus. I'm not sure how he lived up to that unless he was always like, hey, call me Justice, <laughs> you know? We know nothing about this guy other than this is the only place he shows up in Scripture. This Jesus called Jesus. We don't know anything about his history beforehand. We don't know anything about him afterwards. He shows up nowhere else. He's a stranger at the table. But yet he's being included in this message going forth to Colossae. 
Jesus called Justice. Not the Jesus of Nazareth, but a Jesus called Justice. And these are, these are kind of fellow Jews with Paul, and he, he, he states that here. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort for me. Proved a comfort. So Paul and Timothy and, and their fellow Jews, Aristarchus and Mark, Jesus called Justice. And, and don't, don't forget, out here, sending that letter forward, is Tychus and Philemon and characters, and these people have been included at the table. But there's some Greeks among them. Timothy's half-Greek, and Epaphras is sitting in this seat at kind of the proverbial table. Is, is who is this guy? He shows up in some other passages too, but he has a lot of accolades that Paul is speaking into his life. And I don't want you to miss this. Epaphras, who is one of you, so he must have been from the region, of Colossae. He's one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus. He sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you. The word there is agonizing in prayer for you that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. For the whole tri-city area, Epaphras is working hard. We find out from other passages of Scripture that, that Epaphras is the church planter. He's the one that has stimulated the beginnings, of the early church in, in these areas. And I wonder, I wonder if there is some sort of, Paul has never visited that area as far as we've studied. And I wonder if there's a little bit of an envy from Paul. Man, because his heart, his desire is to meet the unreached, and especially the Gentile world. And he had never been to Colossae or Hierapolis or Laodicea. And I wonder what, I wonder what this relationship is was really like, and, and, and he sat in a privileged seat here next to Paul, being included in the table. And next to him is someone that we are more familiar with, but he doesn't have as much accolades over his name because to the people that day, they just knew who he was, who he would be next to Paul. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor. What? Luke is at the table? Yeah, Luke. The physician, the doctor, Luke, the writer of the gospel, is sitting at the table. He's been invited to be part of this. And, and who is this Luke? Well, he, yes, he's the writer of the gospel of Luke. And he's a physician. And so I, I'm sure somewhere along the line he, was, he, he had to help Paul out, all the dangers that Paul got through and so forth, the struggles. And so I'm sure he medicated or came to his aid. But he was more than that. He was a private investigator. He was, he was somewhat commissioned. He was financially independent to be able to go and, and track down the, the story of Jesus, this mystery of Jesus. And maybe like any other gospel, he articulates it in such a human way that it's like, oh, man, a physician would do that well. And so, so he discovers and, and writes down the, the life of Christ and somewhere along the way, Luke gets caught up in the story. So he's not only just writing about it now, but you, you read the book of Acts, which he also wrote. But something changes about midway through the book of Acts. There's these we statements. And so it goes from talking about you and them there to we. So he starts to include himself in the story. And we see him in, in the European uh, mission trip as, as Paul goes into Europe a little bit, into the Grecian Isles and so forth. Luke is there. Luke is also there on the shipwreck, by the way. It's a little nuance there that he includes himself in a privileged position, and he's able to, to record that. He has a, a unique position at the table. All walks of life represented here, included, have a seat at the table. And then someone next to Luke that we don't know much about either, Demas, he also sends greetings who is this Demas? Well, he shows up in the greeting in the book of Philemon also. And well, The only thing else we know about this Demas is he shows up in the latter end of 2 Timothy. And I just want to pull out. Uh, Paul is kind of by himself. He'd been in prison for a while, and he'd sent a lot of these people away. And, and Luke is only the one there for him, and he's hoping Timothy will come back and visit him. And this is what he says in verse 9 of chapter 4. Do your best, Timothy, to come to me quickly. For Demas... Because he has loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas gave up. Gave up on Paul. And because the world was so attractive to him, he gave up on his faith. But yet he's included. He's invited 
to partake of this great mystery, to be consumed by, to be discipled by, to be consumed by Jesus, the, the great mystery of him. Great mystery. And I don't, I don't know where you're at necessarily today, but I want to take just a moment and see if we can relate to some of these people at the table. And, and maybe, maybe you have been given the privilege to give oversight to your family, to your business, to a ministry, or whatever that is. How, how are you doing with that? How are you stewarding that, that privilege? You're the matriarch, the patriarch of your family. And, and maybe the challenge is to simply say, are, are, are you at least getting an opportunity to, to pray at the family meal or pray over your kids? How are you stewarding the privilege of having the gravity, the responsibility of having that seat? Or maybe you're like Timothy and you're middle age and, and someone has been discipling you. And are you ready to be, for the torch to be passed on to you? Are you, are you the Joshua ready to take Moses' place? All right, maybe, maybe you're a runner, and maybe, maybe you've got the legs for it, and maybe you're just in and out and sharing that message, and you're excited and zealous for your faith, or maybe you're like One Onesimus, who needed to have that hard conversation with someone that they wronged. Maybe that's, maybe that's you today. Maybe this chair is for you. Put yourself in that kind of position. Or maybe you're like Aristarchus who doesn't think they have anything to offer, but I guarantee you that Paul knew he had something to offer. You may not think that you have the gift mix. You may not think that you are hospitable enough. You may not think that you can do whatever that is, but I guarantee you you can encourage someone. Aristarchus played a major role in the life of Paul and the ministry of the mystery going forward. Aristarchus, that, that could be you. Or maybe you're here today, and this is a word for you that... There's a relationship that needs to be reconciled. It doesn't matter which side of the coin you're on. You could have been the one that's gotten hurt, or you could have been the one that's done the hurting. But it is so powerful, and you know it when you've seen it. When you've seen a relationship getting reconciled, it is so powerful. So why not? Why not be the one to take the first step? To allow Jesus to reconcile that rela relationship. And you, you could be here today and you're thinking, what in the world is that guy doing up there with all the seats? You could be the stranger, right? Like Justice here on the end. And he's just gleaning. He's just listening in. That could be you today. Welcome. Because there is something here to be so consumed by that it will wreck your life. It will change you. If you think through the, the mystery of who Jesus was, that could be you today. This, this could be you. You could be a person of privilege. And, and you may have other people looking at you in envy because you're able to do what they wish they could do. That, that could be you today. How, how are you stewarding that privilege? Both Epaphras and Luke, both of them, have got great privilege, but great responsibility with that as well. That, that could be you. This, this chair could be you as well. Or someone you know, Demas, man, it seemed like he was being discipled. He was being included, had a seat at the table, and yet the things of the world arrested his attention, and it pulled him away from following Christ all in. That could be you. So what's, what's on your table? Where does the, where does the conversation come to? We, my little girl, five years old, we... We have like the family conversation. I don't know how you um, get to that point in your, in your families where you're just like, we need to have the talk. And so in our family, it's always been, uh, it's time for the family conversation. And my little girl, five years old, she, her vocabulary is growing. And every time she heard us say that, she thought we were saying calm conversation. We got to have the calm conversation, you know, hearing that from a little five-year-old, which says something about our family. I'm so glad it's not the heated conversation or whatever. But, but those calm conversations, what does that look like to you in your setting? Maybe, maybe the point of some of this visiting today is you need to have room at the table for someone who's not like you. Is there space? Is there a chair that, that you can open up? Or maybe you need to open up. Maybe your life is so full that some of your friends, you need to, like, I need some space so that other people can come in. I know even as a church, sometimes we get together so well and we fellowship with certain people that we don't always have the time to see the new faces. 
And if you're that person, forgive us because we get so consumed with our little bubble sometimes that we don't always go out of our way to make room for someone that we've not seen before. God, I don't know where this message lands in the individual's lives today. We, we pray that uh, your spirit and only your spirit can reach to the heart, not just on the surface, not on just, oh, that was a good talk. Oh, I like that illustration. No, only your spirit can follow through, can help us, can equip us to follow through. It's only your spirit, it's only your spirit that can convict and bring us to the source of our great need. And God, in, in serving you, we realize the best way to do that is to serve other people. And so, God, we, we just want you to help us see even just that one individual today that who needs to have a seat at the table? Or where is my seat at the table? How can I be more responsible in ushering this, this mystery of Christ forward? And, and maybe to consume it so much that it overflows and wants to flow into other tables. Or maybe we take it, maybe we're the messengers, God. Would, whatever it is, wherever this lands, God, would we, can we become part of the story just like Luke was? That it's just not talking about the story, but we become part of it. So overwhelmed and consumed by it, but we can't help but share and be devoted to this fabulous mystery that, God, you took our place. And not only so that it's reciprocated that in this exchange of identities, you see us as your sons, your daughters. God, we need reminded of that every morning. It's so easy to forget and be consumed, just like Demas was, to, to get caught up in the things of this world. So, Father, we just pledge once again here this morning. We, we pledge our allegiance to you and you only. And in so doing, God, we, we need the freedom and, and the reminders of your spirit every day. Not just today. Monday morning. <laughs> in all the spheres of influence that you give us at every table you allow us to sit at, maybe we be mindful of where we sit and how we can invite others, include others at the table. Thank you, Jesus, for that privilege in your name. Amen.